Welcome to Successful Living with Bill Knappick. Every week we talk about success and everything that goes along with it. You'll learn the principles of success, how to achieve success, and learn to overcome challenges that may be getting in the way of success in your life. You'll hear from Bill Knappick, a radio personality and business development expert, along with insight from special guests. If you're ready to find your path to success or take the success you're enjoying to the next level, stay tuned. Successful Living with Bill Knappick is on right now. And I am with Megan Abbott. She is an author of the current book called You Will Know Me. Megan, thank you and welcome to the show. I was so happy to be here. Well, books are such a part of everybody's life and they're inspiring. Let's tell people about the book that you have out now called You Will Know Me. Ah, great. Yeah, it's uh, about the family of a prodigy. I've always been interested in the families of prodigies, uh, some a special child who has some kind of special talent, and what that does to a family, how it affects the power relations in the family. And so in this case, it's about the parents of a, a gymnast, a very high-achieving gymnast who's 15, and she's been doing it since she was three, and the whole family is invested in it. Um, and then something bad happens. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, won't, I won't spoil it. We don't want to, we don't <laughs> want to do that no. but it, it is interesting because that is also an interesting age at 15 now I am not finished with the book I'm on uh, page 200 as of this interview and it is the intensity is actually when I picked up the book and started you could almost feel that intensity of the competitiveness the drivenness of this individual Devin in this case right. and also the kind of tentacles that reach out to her family and it's like a contagious thing right <laughs> exactly no it's so true everybody you know it's sort of you want to do everything you can for your child I think parents are very encouraged now to be more attentive to their children and more involved and to push them into things so in the case when your child already has this ambition or dream I think her parents really want to do everything they can to achieve it and I think that that of course can become problematic in a family um, when it's they're all become so invested in this one thing uh, you know and the stakes get higher and higher and also the other part when we talk about the family the mother the father she has a brother in this case and he plays a role in the family too and there's also the the suggestion like or, or the feeling that maybe he's not getting as much attention, right? right. And that, that's a typical dynamic in a, in a high achiever, right? Exactly. I, I, I remember, not that it's about me, but I remember when <laughs> I was a kid, my brother was a very good baseball player, uh, really successful, and I was the kid, the sibling, younger daughter, you know, the, I was the daughter, the sister, in the bleachers through my whole childhood, having to watch all the games, and, you know, I, but I was not athletic, and I was not involved in it. So, I, you know, there's a, the brother of Devin, Drew, in the book, um, there's a lot of that feeling, I think, of neglect <laughs> that exactly. comes from me. <laughs> well, let's tell people the the inspiration, because now this, what number book is this for this you? This is my eighth. I can't believe Your it. Your eighth yeah. book. <laughs> yes. And, it, and it, I've just discovered you, so I'm already decided which book I'm going to read next yes. in your, in your yes. arsenal of books. But, <laughs> but as far as this book, you will know me. What was the thing that inspired you to take someone that is the high achiever, the family dynamic, and even the competitiveness of, of her of her sport? It's very rare that I have a moment where it's one moment of inspiration, but in this book I did. It was uh, the last Olympics. It was exactly four years ago, the London Olympics, and the, we had a really successful gymnastics team, as we're, as we're going to this time, and uh, there was this viral footage of Allie Raisman, one of the gymnasts of her parents, watching her perform her uneven bars routine, and people thought it was really funny because the parents were so looked so nervous, and they were so invested in it, and they were moving as she would move, and they were pumping their fists and cursing, you know, and, and uh, you know, people made a lot of fun of it. It was almost like a Saturday Night Live skit. It was so over the top. Um, but some people also criticized them as being stage parents, and all of it seemed really complicated. And I wondered what a marriage like that was like and what a family like that was like and how parents separate their own dreams from their child's. That's right. We are, and, and I have a son, we are connected to our children, and when they succeed, we feel like we succeed, and when they fall short, it's like, oh no! Right. I mean, I think you know, it's a good thing, but it's thing you know, it's good to be you know really connected to your children. It's what you want, but it can turn on a dime into something more complicated and painful for everybody. And I think a lot about kids that have very passionate about something like gymnastics or some kind of sport or piano or whatever, and they may at some point lose interest, but. 
we, you know, are, do they even feel like they can? Are they allowed to? Because now the, the whole family has become so invested in it. gymnastics. is a very expensive sport to involve your kids in. There might be a level of guilt on the child. My parents have done all this for me. I have to keep doing it for them. It's very hard to tell the difference, I think. There's a lot of pressure. And when I remember opening the book, when we talk about gymnastics, I think it's very dangerous so that right away you you engage the reader if they're thinking about what's involved in gymnastics and how dangerous it is it is for a child and then their parents yeah they want them to succeed but they also want them to be safe too absolutely and you know gymnastics you, you can break your neck of course i mean it's sort of really kind of basic and you're making yourself your body do things it's really not supposed to do and for parents to to be a part of that it's really a complicated feeling for them i think watching it that they would be helping their child do this thing that puts them at risk constantly and also you were i read the article just recently about two weeks ago in the in the wall street journal fascinating how it talked about some of your ideas in writing and, and the, the pacing of the book, where you get the ideas. But let's tell people you had the idea for the book, and then what do you do? Because a lot of people are out there thinking, hey, I can write a book. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that idea after you, you get it? It's very, you know, I've, I've had a lot of false starts in all my I mean, books I've abandoned. Sometimes you don't know. You have an idea. You think it's going to work. You, you write 80 pages even, and you realize it hasn't caught fire or there's, some, there's something missing in it for me it's often once I have the voice of my main character so much so that I can almost I feel like I'm thinking their thoughts and until you know in the case of Katie who's the mother in this book it took me a while I, I don't I'm not a mother and I don't ha I'm not the mother of a prodigy either so it took me a while to understand her and I wanted her to be sympathetic and not a stereotype you know of a stage mother so once I had her voice it was just a matter of putting her in these escalating situations and seeing what she would do and at a certain point she sort of told me what she was going to do you know so it's a gradual process um, in terms of the suspense it's that's a lot of revision you know to make sure you know you end up cutting a lot you know we want to keep it tight you want to keep the reader engaged you don't you know you don't want their eyes to drift we have a lot of distractions now in the world and you want to hold on to them so often it's in the revision process that that gets you know that sort of catch fire feeling so you get the idea when you get the idea do you also get that main character that is speaking to you at that same time or how does that work you hope you do and sometimes maybe you they can draw, both come yeah, at once sometimes they can sometimes you start with a main character in this book i wasn't even sure if it was going to be the mother or the daughter or the, or the husband you know whose point of view is going to be and i eventually landed with the mother um so i just i knew in this case i knew the story was on um, but i didn't know whose point of view i'd be telling it from um, sometimes it's the other way. Sometimes you have a voice, but you really just can't figure out what the how to build the the plot, um, and then and then things just you know with a crime novel, which this is, or a suspense novel, I suppose, you really ha plot matters so much. You want the reader to keep turning the pages, so you really need to have a a, a plot that just draws their eyes and doesn't let them go. And also in this book, as you s went forth with the idea the character is speaking to you you're going along with that do you know did you know the ending at the time i did i did i have to know the ending when i start sometimes it changes that's the place you're going to right yeah exactly no it feels like uh i always call it the motel sign on the dark road you know like if you if you don't see that sign you don't really know where you're going uh and you know i i think that's really important i know some writers who write entirely you know they call them pantsers because they write you know off the seat of their pants you know but i'm i'm not that way i have to know where it ends up i'm not an outliner i don't plot you know beat by beat but i do have to know what where i want to end where i need to be and when we talk about the discipline of writing do you have set times i've talked to authors where they say hey, well every day from this hour to this hour how do how do you work your craft and and is it a discipline like that it is and I, I wish I were one of those I know some writers who can write anywhere and they you know they have an hour their airport they can pull out their laptop and do it I am not one of those writers I have to be at the computer all day I have to you know I can't make lunch plans I can't you know anything to get me out of the head will be disastrous for me because I'll never go back to the computer so I really devote my day time you know I start very early and I go till about mid to late afternoon and I just commit myself to it. Sometimes I come out of it with four pages, sometimes I have four sentences. You never know. 
And in the case of the book, you will know me, and I'll hold it up for those that are yes. tuning in on YouTube. How long did it take to write this book? <laughs> it took the first draft, I'd say, maybe 11 months and then another six months of revision. So for crime writers, that's sort of in between. I know some crime writers that can bang out a really fast first draft, um, but I know some who are, you know, who are even slower than me. <laughs> wow, and that's great. That's dedication, too. Yeah. Plus, you get so attached to it, I would think, along the way. How yeah. do you know when it's time? when you wrote the last page yeah usually I often ha write the last page earlier uh, sometimes I it comes to me but but when I reach the end sometimes sometimes it's just like you know it's time to leave that world it's almost like they're pushing you out your characters are saying we're done with you we don't need you anymore <laughs> well Megan also let's tell people about your website if they want to see all your books there and the book you will know me what is the site it's uh, meganabbott.com two B's two T's that's too easy <laughs> yes yes and I strongly recommend the book you will know me at what point in your life did you say i want to be an author and at what point did you really get traction Boy, yeah, I really backed into it, I must admit. To me, uh, it seemed fantastical, the notion of being a writer. You know, how do you how do you become a novelist? How do you get a book published? I didn't understand any of it. So um, when I was, I went to graduate school for English. I was going to be a teacher. And I was studying uh, crime fiction was my uh, thesis. So I was writing about crime fiction and reading an enormous amount of it, like 1940s and 50s, Raymond Chandler, you know, like the Dashiell Hammett the classics and on the side I started to write my a novel and I just got very lucky with getting an agent right away which never happens it was just a sort of set of circumstances that was the easiest part then there was a lot of struggle along the way you know finding readership uh, a publisher that would really promote me you know and uh, you know sort of finding my voice so uh, traction I would say happened in maybe the last maybe the last four books have been a big difference you know you grow readers each time you try to um, and so it's been a little it's been it's been much better for me in recent years because I, I remember hearing some authors I, I think it was John Grisham that had had tried with his first book and then he had a, a trunk full of his books where he would drive <laughs> yeah. around trying to sell yeah. them but that's a long time ago so th yeah. that is a good point in any business in any kind of marketing whatever it is music real estate anything how do we get outside of the noise because it is so competitive Absolutely. so how, how do you think that worked for you you're, you're putting forth great content interesting stories with with a that pull you in right away so but but how do you see it work from your perspective as the yeah. author yeah it, you know and you never really know what it is but I think one thing that did help me is that uh, crime fiction tends to be very heavily dominated by male writers but the biggest readers of crime fiction are women so I think I was able to stand out a little more as a woman with predominantly female characters I write about men and women but there's a lot of strong female protagonists in in the books and I think when I came up 10 years ago with the first book now, there wasn't that many. Um, and I think that would enabled, I think reviewers found my books more because it wasn't something they were used to seeing. And I think that that helped a lot, helped me stand out. So I, and I tried to take advantage of that by really writing as complicated female characters as I could, not the generic ones who are used to the femme fatale, you know, the sort of standard female crime fiction characters. And also uh, one of the things I think about as an author, and I think it's very attractive to those that think about writing a book or hope to be successful in doing so and that is it seems like it's something you can do anywhere so I can live wherever I want and become this author because I could just send my stuff in but you happen to live in New York City so yes. I think that's an advantage is it? It, it well it certainly is for networking purposes because you're that's where publishing lives so you can you know meet up with your agent your editor all the time you know all famous writers are coming through there all the time so you can meet you know, meet many of your idols and sometimes they will help you you know give you nice words to put on the cover of your book you know um, so I think it's very good but it's also it's a place of great noise so for some writers I think it's debilitating and they end up moving away because it's there's so much happening there and of course writing to some degree requires peace you know? well you bring forth something that is a I'm curious about it and that is when you see a book you do have other writers and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and even just other people 
put something about the book. How does that happen in the in the in the business of the writing? Yeah, it's complicated. It's a uh, uh, you know, and some people argue that it doesn't matter, but I know I often buy a book because a writer I like has has blurbed it, you know, put nice words on the cover. And for instance, mine has Paula Hawkins, who wrote Girl on the, Tra- on the Train, which was so successful, and and I knew that that would be helpful. Uh, but often. If I make a connection with a writer, I would I have to ask them, and it's often very awkward if they consider reading it, and if they like it, they might say something. But often my editor will do it, or my agent. Sometimes they just find it and contact you, and that's always the best thing. Uh, Indeed. Really... The, the other thing I w- would ask is on, in any book, covers attract the potential reader, yes. and the cover is so important. I'm going to hold this up for the YouTube Demons, video. Yes. You will know me, but what in your case? How do the covers uh, evolve? It's it's a quite a process because in some ways it's not. It's really the publisher's decision, certainly because they're the one who have to market and sell it. So I certainly the things that I might like on a cover maybe wouldn't be something that they know will work in a store. And often big booksellers like Barnes and Noble have opinions about if they have a lot of books that look a certain way sometimes they're on the shelves they're tired of seeing that and they're tired of seeing so there's trends in book covers um, but in this case for instance though it's a book about the, one of the main characters is a teenage gymnast you don't want to suggest that this is only a, a book for teenagers because it's quite an adult book and the main character is a, a mother um, and you don't want to suggest that it's a book that only female readers would like so we tried to thread the needle with the cover you know that you, you're trying to draw new readers in you're not trying to push anyone away so you don't want it to be too feminine too girly and I know some male writers don't want it to be too masculine so no women will buy it you know it gets it gets really into branding and in the case of this book, to me, it looks mysterious. Yes. And the part that draws me in is like, you will know me. And I see the face, yes. the dark colors, and the, the face emerging out of the darkness. That yes. uh, That is absolutely fascinating. Now, as we think about what lies ahead, you have to be super excited. You've gotten great attention, Wall Street Journal, and you're on our radio show. Yes. And you're in the fourth <laughs> largest city, Houston, yeah. Texas, where we're getting to talk. Mm-hmm. But you're people find you as an author don't they and uh, exhibiting that is that now you're going to be writing for a tv show coming yes. in 2017 let's talk That's about right. that yes i'm really writing david simon who is famous for his tv shows on hbo the wire and treme he has a new show coming next year called the deuce and it's set in 1970s times square new york uh, I'm, I'm writing for that now um with a lot of my writer heroes uh a lot of other crime writers are writing on it um and i'm just thrilled it's so different though when you write novels, you're writing by yourself. In this case, it's the writer's room, quote unquote. It's a group of people in a room breaking out story, arguing over characters. So it's you know you go from being all by yourself and making all your own decisions. There's to a this. there's a movie right there. <laughs> I, know. I don't know if that's ever been so, done. But but let's let's describe. Are you doing it right now? Even yeah. though it's going to be 2000. So there's a lot of when we see these TV shows of any kind a lot of preparation goes into it will this show be an hour or a half hour it'll show it'll be an hour show and there'll be eight episodes for the first season so tell us what goes in the process of writing an hour show and with how many about about writers. six writers so uh, six of yeah. you are in a room yep Yes, and so everybody talks about the story together and talks about character arcs for all the main characters and where we want to end up. And so then we start to break it into episodes, and then two writers per episode get assigned a script. You know, so so you know, like I write one draft of one script, and then another writer writes over that draft, and it's because it's all got to sound like one voice. You know, have you ever seen a TV show where there's an episode where characters seem to be behaving differently um, and out of character? That's because no one was in charge of sort of no one was watching you know minding that it should sound like it it belongs you know everything sort of fits so they try to make everything smooth and sound the same so every, everything you write gets written over it is a fascinating process because the consumer that consumes the shows and books or whatever you see it there and then you become hey i like this i want to know what happens next or i don't or i'll move on to something right. else so it's a tremendous i i love the behind the scenes look and and what about the actual logistics of this is it monday through friday 
from X amount of time to another time? How does that work? Some shows are. Uh, you know, there are some shows that do 22 episodes a season. They just need to be in the room five days a week for an extended time. With with this, we meet, we've met four times for a week at a time, uh, and then we break and write and then come back. Um, and they're shooting now. You know, they're shooting five episodes into the So episodes. the shooting's already begun. Yeah, yeah. So, so that and we have to make changes based on elements of production or the way actors playing a part and you have to sort of make modulations yeah that's fascinating and do you have contact with the the actors and actresses in the show a little bit it's james franco and maggie gyllenhaal so some big stars and uh, they that you know it's rather intimidating uh they tried to keep the writers away from the actors i think i must confess because the actors always want to know what's going to happen to them and the writers are not supposed to tell them <laughs> but actors can be very charming oh, and they use that charm yeah. don't they yeah no doubt about it well so that's 2017 so that'll come on and there'll be eight episodes and i guess like any other series if it's if people accept that's it right. and, and they say hey give us more here here we go again right yeah exactly then that's what you hope you hope for a second season and uh hbo is known for for giving you know second season so we're hopeful <laughs> what, what, what a vehicle hbo too yeah, that is yeah you just you must be going be super excited about these yeah. things happening yeah right? it's, it's an exciting time for sure it's a it's a little bit like i keep pinching myself or having that imposter syndrome you know Know, where you think I'm fooling everybody I'm fooling them to thinking I really know what I'm doing but you do <laughs> I do and, but, it, but it goes to show everyone does something and hopefully people are successful in that they do what both they love they're passionate about and also where their skill set is some yeah. people could be passionate about things but they don't have the the gift for it so there it may just be a hobby but right. someone like you you have the created uh, inspiration you have the creative abilities and you love doing this and it, th there's also the thing I would ask now is that that is all great but also there's the business side mm -hmm. so it's it's like a constant uh, it's fascinating all the, the the gears that go in to do this it's yeah. amazing no it, and the business part is the most challenging I think for we writers because we don't we don't really know much about business <laughs> and you were not used to be you know we have agents and things that handle certain aspects but there is a you know as opposed to the publishing world which is very much about the art uh, television is very much about commerce so you do you do find yourself often thinking in a different way which is which is to be good for you, right? Awesome. Also, Megan, in your profession, tell me if you ever think about this. I think I would. The legacy that you leave, mm -hmm. one of the beauties of what you do when you write a book like You Will Know Me mm -hmm. or The Fever or any of your books or the TV series. Sometimes the TV series goes on. It's not successful, right? But then, then years later, it becomes huge. Right. What do you think about when you think about the legacy that you leave? Well, I it's one it's one of the best parts of it tingles. to me. Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly because you know I grew up reading older crime fiction that I you know that that has endured and you can still read it today and it feels as as alive as ever. So the idea there's been a lot of worry about ebooks, for instance, but that means your books never go out of print. And it used to be often your books would, but now because of you know ebooks, you can remain in print forever, so people can find your books forever, and that is a kind of wonderful legacy. See, you know there's still something about holding the book i agree I, i've been reading your book it's a real <laughs> book but i do like the ebook because that way you can read it without having a lighting right next to your chair or yes. having the right kind of chair so you yes. can read it at night or outside yes. and so traveling that, too <laughs> and that's super cool well tell us what else would you like people to know about what you're doing the books that you've written uh, well, I guess I would say, um, you know, my books tend to fall, in, you know, they're crime fiction, but they're not particularly violent. Um, and they are focused, I think, on issues we can all relate to. So that's always been important to me that, you know, we all have complicated families, maybe marriages that, you know, have have highs and lows and and all that. And I think that that um, we really connect to those books. And that's what in my books, that's what I try to do. I try to make them real world issues that are somewhat heightened but that also keep you engaged and and are also kind of escapism which i think is okay that's right because we get reality all exactly, day long i, I exactly. like the escape part <laughs> about tv movies and books yeah. now if someone picks up the book you will know me and they read that first like i'm doing mm -hmm. and when i finish i'm on page 200 
They're going to finish it tonight. <laughs> but in the meantime, what would be the next book they should read out of your arsenal of books? I what guess, would you suggest? Yeah, I guess if they like that one, uh, the previous one, The Fever, which which I'm working on now for my own TV project, would be a good one. Because there's some ways they're connected. That's also about a family. Uh, it's about a mysterious illness in a small town. Um, and I think that, that the two sort of go together that way. It's people seem to like that one too, or the one they, at least the ones who didn't didn't tell me. <laughs> well, that will be my next book. And if one last thing, anything else you'd like people to to know? Uh, no, but I'm so happy to be in Houston again, which has one of the greatest mystery bookstores in the country, uh, right, right, right here, Murder by the Book. So. That is awesome, <laughs> Murder by the Book here in Houston, Texas, the fourth largest city. It's not as big as New York, but we have a lot of stuff going yes, on here, you don't do. we? Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much. Tell them your website again, Megan. It's a W www.meganabbott.com. Very nice, ladies and gentlemen. Megan Abbott, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.